good to go, I guess. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hope everyone is enjoying the conference. Um, thank you for having us here. My name is Dr. Cusell from the University of Louisville in Kentucky. This is Dr. John Slish from the University of Florida. Um, we're both uh, uh, physicians involved in law enforcement. We also have a couple other members who aren't here present with us responsible for this lecture, Dr. Matt Ryan and Dr. Jolie McGreevy, um, that are making this possible, this uh, lecture possible. And we're going to talk about the ethical implications of the tactical um, physician. So something that we're going to talk about today is kind of what are some of these ethical dilemmas we find ourselves in, uh, involved with not just law enforcement, but involved with the tactical aspects of law enforcement, and also um, how, what is some of our ethics with our oaths that we take called do no harm and how that affects with law enforcement and what responsibilities we have as physicians. I hope to have it about eight to seven minutes um, open so that we can have some question and answer during this time, um, and uh, uh, we'll try to answer your questions as best as we can. A couple disclaimers, we have no financial disclosures at this time. Um, one thing, we are not lawyers, nor are we medical ethicists, and we only have 20 minutes to talk about a pretty complex topic uh, within the field of law enforcement medicine. Additionally, this is specific to U.S. law enforcement, uh, so if anyone's from international partners, this was only going to apply to the United States. And also, Dr. Slish and myself are involved in law enforcement, so we have our own uh, internal biases. So. For those of you who are not familiar what tactical emergency medicine or, or tactical emergency medical support is, it was established in 1994 by the National Tactical Officers Association, which is a group of uh, uh, police that now have a wing of uh, police physicians. And they created a position statement in 1994 and then also, again, uh, revised it in 2007. And what it says is the duties of the physician are very similar to um, the EMS medical director. So number one, you have to oversee the training. Number two, you create protocols. Number three, you uh, make sure you oversee the clinical competencies. And of course, like any good uh, program, you have some type of quality insurance program. So very similar to what the EMS physician does. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated. It is dependent state by state and by um, department by department. Uh, one of the most common things that you can do or that our, our police surgeons typically uh, run into is that occupational and team health. So knowing the medical conditions of your own team, such as if you have a diabetic on your SWAT team, knowing and you're going to have, and as Dr. Slish says, two individuals on his team. So you have to monitor their blood glucose. And if you're at a prolonged um, uh, hostage standoff, that could be eight hours, and you got to make sure they're well fed and that they're not getting um, uh, into a diabetic coma right after entry. Additionally, if you have a, a dive team or evidence recovery team, you have to keep in mind if they have sinus issues before diving, they can't dive because that's a contraindication. So knowing those contraindications and being that occupational side. Additionally, for the departments, you have to be their conscience or their, um, their medical conscience. So not only do we have to take care of our victims, but we also have to make sure that we're following our, the United Nations um, and our uh, direction from the Department of Justice to make sure we're also taking care uh, of the subjects. And then finally, it also has a level of training. Are you training just certain individuals in your department, or is it all of your officers in the police academy to learn basic uh, medical treatment? Now, there are two roles when we talk about physicians' involvement in tactical team. There is the physician in the stack or a physician who is sworn, is carrying uh, or is armed uh, with a weapon, and is also known as an operator. And so someone that is actually involved in an operator with the SWAT team. Uh, so that's that armed role um, that they have, and that's what Dr. Slish does in his department. But then the more common that we see is more of the physician in the warm zone. So you're kind of away from the initial um, entry and the initial um, gunfight. And then once that area is secure or it's secure enough that you can enter, they say medic up, and the physician or medic will enter the uh, warm zone to take care of a team member or the hostage. Uh, a lot of this time, the physician is dressed in the same gear as the tactical team, but they don't carry uh, a firearm. So I'm sure you're asking yourselves, What's new? Why are we talking about this at an academic um, conference rather than something like SOMA or some other type of NAMSP? Well, the question is, and the ethics that we're talking about is, in the most, re most recently or in most previous memory, off, there's been no direction from the Department of Justice to care for victims after they've been shot. And so there's been a lot of national discussion with the recent civil unrest, whether or not police officers should be required to provide medical aid to people they've shot. And so the Department of Justice recently, in May 20, 2022, basically said, yes, they should. And so there is an affirmative duty to render medical aid. And so it not, uh, not only says to render medical aid, but to also become trained in providing some sort of medical uh, care as needed. So as an academic physician, most of us 
serve or work in large metropolitan areas in level one trauma centers. So it's gonna probably be over the next couple years, we might be seeing these large metropolitan police departments asking us to help train them and help make sure that they abide by this mandate from the Department of Justice. Now there are three tiers of involvement that you can as a tactical physician, or it's not really tiers, this is kind of my own arbitrary tier um, form. Tier one is kind of what, uh, just basically giving basic training. So um, learning how, teaching your operators and your police, maybe in the academy, maybe in separate training with your special teams to do basic tactical casualty combat care or some stop the bleed. So learning, teaching them how to do wound packing, teaching them how to put a bolus chest seal on a sucking chest wound, teaching them how to do a tourniquet application or even perhaps doing some airway positioning and nasal pharyngeal airway. So all these can be uh, ways that you can treat, uh, teach them. Uh, this individual up here is uh, Officer uh, Jonathan Fisher. He's an EMT that's gone through our EMT program and actually is teaching a, a SWAT operator how to do some wound packing. So that's kind of the tier one basic things that we can be involved as physicians and have that oversight on that team. So when they're waiting, instead of waiting 20 minutes for EMS to leave their staging area for a scene to be secure, the officers can secure the scene and begin rendering aid. Now there's also the EMT basic and EMTAs that you can train. I know LA Police Department actually has paramedics as part of their program, but you can actually now insert those individuals. In my uh, police department, we actually created um, a EMT program and we now have 18 EMTs on our police department and we are inserting them into our special teams like SWAT, our hazardous incident response team, our bomb team, and then we have a separate rehabilitation team for unrest or, or um, rioting. And then finally, tier three, a little bit more involvement from the physician rather than just that medical oversight. It can be um, actually going to the police academy and being sworn as an officer or attending some more training. So this is a, a picture of uh, CONTOMS, which gives you your EMTT tact or your EMT tactical. Um, and so you can either become a sworn officer, get involved with CONTOMS and learn the tactics or even SORMED, which is a private company that gets your ta tactical medical practitioner. So that's a little bit about what kind of involvement physicians can have. And so I believe Dr. Slish and I have this same ethical duty um, to officers. And the numbers are pretty staggering. In 2021, we lost 701 US peace officers killed in the line of duty. In 2022, we had 246. But the real staggering number I want to point out is the 60,000 US officers assaulted in the line of duty in 2021. And so multiple of those had to be uh, taken to the hospital. And so another duty of, a, of the tactical physician is that duty to the officer and to go to the hospital and liaison between the hospital staff and the police department so that there's a, a, acute messaging or good messaging between the two. Now, in addition to the duty to the officers, we also have a duty to the suspect. Now, Tennessee versus Garner in 1985 did uphold that in special situations, uh, police could use deadly force, but that does not renege us of this uh, uh, responsibility to care for those individuals we, um, we harm. And so there really wasn't anything before the United Nations Human Rights Commission actually made a standard of, or a code of conduct for LEOs. There had been Geneva Convention, but that really only provided to military personnel, not really to law enforcement. So the UN Code of Conduct basically states that uh, peace officers or law enforcement officers should take immediate action to secure medical attention whenever required. Now this came out in early 2000s compared to the DOJ which just put out uh, their recommendations in 2022. Now let's enter the tactical arena and talk a little bit about some case studies that will challenge these ethical principles. So case study one, we have SWAT is activated at 4 a.m. and for uh, shots fired during a domestic dispute. The partner is held hostage, negotiation, negotiators are present, and the individual and the hostage are barricaded in the home. The suspect continues to assault the hostage verb, and has also made a verbal threat to kill the hostage. So during the breach, the, they make a decision to enter, and the suspect is shot multiple times, the hostage is bleeding, and the team member is also shot. So the question, the ethical question is, who do we care for first? That's kind of a difficult decision. You have multiple people injured, you're one sole provider, or one sole physician, who do you care for first? Now, luckily, that question is a little bit easy. The National Tactical Officers Association determined that they have a priority of care. And that priority of care starts with the hostage, then the innocent children, followed by law enforcement officials, and then followed by the suspect. Now, let me mud muddy the waters a little bit. Let's imagine that your hostage and your law enforcement official are both black tag in start and smart triage, whereas your suspect is red tag. 
a little bit more to get into than what we have in this 20 minutes, but it can really muddy the waters. And where, who do you start the treatment of? Yes, we have the priority of care, but that can cause some confusion. Now, in case study two, we have SWAT again activated for shots during a domestic. Uh, negotiations are sex successful after eight hours, and the subject surrenders to law enforcement. The subject is a 50, we find is a 50-year-old male with a past medical history of coronary artery disease and cabbage. He's been taking nitroglycerin sublingual tablets for the past two hours throughout the standoff and is now complaining of chest pain. The patient is declining uh, medical attention at this time. So I have a question for you. Can this person successfully leave against medical advice and be an AMA when he's surrounded by armed officers? Or is there some level of coercion? So we all understand refusal of medical care. You have to exhibit some of these four, these four abilities. But it becomes a little bit different when you've been staging, this person hasn't eaten, they haven't drank in the past eight hours. There's been a very stressful situation over the last eight hours. So do they really have the capacity to refuse? Do they have the reasoning, especially when they're being stand all around by a bunch of armed officers? And are they able to communicate that choice without a concern for coercion? So these AMAs become a little bit of a, a complicated situation. So the recommendation for the National Tactical Officers Association, as well as a discussion with the AMA and the TALM section for ASAP, is we acknowledge the situation has some degree of coercion and negative influence. And as physicians involved with the tactical team, we're likely going to be dressed just like the other officers. So one of the best things to do or to, to try and mitigate this coercion or this presumption of coercion is to express as a medical physician you are concerned for their well-being, but offer to call a um, civilian EMS for their second opinion and then, of course, document and document. So in the next uh, last seven minutes of our lecture, we want to ask, uh, uh, ask some or uh, take some questions from you all and kind of answer and discuss a little bit more about this ethics. Dr. Slish has had 10 years of law enforcement and 15 years of SWAT experience, so he is a, 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 a wonderful resource to ask these questions and that we can debate and discuss um, the uh, ethics of tactical physicians. Uh, but just to quickly summarize, again, like anything, is taking care of the patient the best you can, what you would want if this was your family member. If you're ending up training law enforcement officials, make sure, remember they're not EMTs, so they do not have a medical license, so it has to be very limited scope. Same that you would give to a civilian, like stop the bleed for basic hemorrhage or airway control. And then, of course, your treatment priorities are going to be civilians first, followed by law enforcement as suspect, and that's the standard of care. We can debate the ethics of whether that is the standard of care, but it is currently um, the standard of care. And of course, refusals in tactical environments can be very complicated. There's another book here that has some legal considerations that um, has a really good, it's endorsed by the uh, Center for Law Enforcement uh, uh, Technology and Training as well as the uh, Anti-Terrorism Association Board that can also have a little, that do have some little uh, section on ethics. But at this time, does anybody have any questions that we'd be happy to answer? See wheels turning out there. Don't be afraid to ask. Please. Then, I guess. Are they embedded with a law enforcement agency, or are they just the EMS director? Okay. If you're sworn with an agency, you need to bring all the medicine to that agency. Just become the police surgeon for that agency. Take it. You're not likely to get paid for it but that's gonna protect you both medically and legally. And it's also gonna give you the information that is really dramatically needed. So I've been a law enforcement officer, solo status for over a decade now. I know what it is. I have a take home patrol car, I have arrest powers 24 seven. I know exactly what they're thinking when that call comes out at 4.03 AM. I know what we're doing, we're going to staging, I know how we're gonna go and I know how this is probably gonna play out. That becomes critical because most people don't have that. And there's a lot of physicians who are EMS providers, medical directors who get attached to an agency, they have no law enforcement authority, they have no arrest powers, they also have no law enforcement experience. That becomes very, very great. That's part of why we're standing up here in front of you. I'm considered an international expert for it as I've got over a decade sworn solo status law enforcement. I've been on a SWAT team for 15 years. I know the tactics. What's funny is I've seen so many tactical changes over the years. The whole, you know, surround and call out now. We used to flood houses, we used to go in Guns blazed and things were wild west, but that's no longer the case. So you have to really get yourself embedded with the agency. If you really want to get the most out of it, you need to go to the police academy. And that's a big undertaking. I've done it. I know Dr. Ackerman's done it. It was one of the longest years of my life, but there's no substitute for that. 
And if you're gonna start carrying a gun and a badge, which it, most people don't know, any sheriff's department, a sheriff has the authority in the United States to deputize any one of you right now. Hand you a gun, hand you a shield, say please don't get caught on YouTube doing something stupid, and off you go. Who feels good about that? Who feels like you're ready and in a good position with that? You're not, and people have gotten themselves into bad situations because of that. I went the long route, whole police academy, whole field training officer program. It is a tremendous undertaking, but it pays off in dividends that you not only become an international expert in the field if you get a decade under your belt, but people will listen to you. They know that you know what you're doing. They know that you've been doing this, and there's no substitute for experience. How many patients have you intubated? You got an N of one, great. Let me give you a difficult airway and see how you do with that. When your N is 5,000, nobody's worried about you walking into that room and getting that airway. Great question. And if you don't mind, I'll take some liberty to add, especially if you're not a sworn, I'm new to law enforcement, haven't gone through the police academy. Um, one of the best course I took was the uh, EMTT, and also the, I recommend the medical director's course with Contant, which is the counter operational narcotics and mm -hmm. counter terrorism medical support course, uh, which kind of helps, takes physicians who have no sworn experience or no law enforcement experience um, and um, gets them involved and teaches them kind of the fundamentals of running a, as a medical director for a tactical team. So they're not the only resource that you have, but they're the only non-commercially available one. And sure. it's kind of the backbone. I went through it, he went through it, even took the medical director's course. It's a great course to add on to your CV, to add on to your knowledge base. But Contoms is kind of the backbone of it all. Then you have TCCC, you have other avenues to get education and get the message out there. Other questions? If not, I do have a question. Sure. So we talked in case study one, uh, and we talked about the black tag hostage, black tag officer, and then a red tag suspect. How do you deal with that um, in the field? So it's no different. There's, there's no difference in capacity. There's no difference in your decision making. The red tag becomes a priority. And that can be difficult. A lot of people can say, you just exchanged gunfire with this guy, and you're going to go in there and render aid. And the answer is yes. I'll date myself here. Who knows the Bank of America shootout, LAPD, 1997? Okay, a few of us in here, all right? The rest of you probably weren't born yet, but it's okay. I'll catch up real quick. So two guys get dressed in Kevlar from head to toe, and they spend over an hour, over 2,000 rounds get exchanged between the LAPD and the two suspects, one of which was named Emil Metasaranu, and they downed one of the other bad guys. He was dead, killed, so they were only focused on Emil Metasaranu at the end of it. So at the end of it, they finally, a couple SWAT guys got together, you know, high speed, low drag. They said, hey, this guy's not going down. We're shooting him with submachine guns, nine millimeters. This guy's not going down. Like, this does not make sense. Well, Kevlar stops nine millimeters. The LAPD was completely unprepared and outgunned by these two guys. And these two guys that are wearing Kevlar all the way down to their ankles, you know, how, how are you gonna take this guy out? So they said, you know what, we're gonna drive a patrol car up there, no vest, no nothing, went in, lay down under patrol car and started shooting him in his ankles and his feet took him down. They ended up taking him out. The LAPD cuffed him, and after an hour, he bled to death on scene. And that was kind of the first real international exposure of law enforcement in the United States. Are we really ethically doing something? And when I've heard that, the only reason I remember Emil Matasarano is his family had the coconuts to actually file a lawsuit against the LAPD. And I was like, wow, that is brass. That is really... But at the end of the day, when you look at the actual legal aspect only of it, there actually was a case. Why do you think there was a case? And I'll tell you, it ended in a uh, deadlock jury, which means you know 50% were for, 50% were against. So that could have went either way. And the LAPD had to spend millions of dollars to defend that case. But why do you think it was a case, and why do you think it was jury deadlocked? There was not a physician on scene, but they did not let EMS come on scene either. So what was the reason? And the reasoning was, well, they didn't know that it was tactically safe. They didn't know that there were still other shooters out there, because you had two guys in full Kevlar. Like, this was mayhem. Multiple agencies, what happens if we get multiple agencies? Loss of communications, can't talk to each other. All the normal things that break down, broke down. So they didn't let anybody come in and they let somebody do what's called deliberate indifference. And I've been lecturing on deliberate indifference for over a decade. Deliberate indifference, the definition of it is effectively when a law enforcement officer uses lethal force. Deliberate indifference has nothing to do with the reason that he's going to get judged for that time and time again for hours and months and years. He'll deal with that. Deliberate indifference is the officer was forced to take lethal action and then failed to render care. So when you take the cases that are out there, and there are multiple, you know, Emil Matasarano was 1997. I'm from Florida, so the case of Trayvon Martin. Who in here knows the case of Trayvon Martin? Very sad, 17-year-old kid, um, 
Florida has a very strong stand your ground law, but that stand your ground law was really kind of tainted with the way that this whole thing played out. So a guy starts a fight with Trayvon Martin and Trayvon Martin, 17 years old, starts whooping up on him, gets the best of him. He pulls out a gun and shoots Trayvon Martin. And they use the Florida stand your ground law to defend him and he actually got off for it. And I kind of had a, you know, coming to Jesus with that, like, wow, that was not what this law was destined for. When you go start a fight with somebody and you start losing, you can't just pull out a gun and go, hey, it was self-defense, it was, you know, stand your ground. So out of that started to snow roll some other bad things. Out of that came the Mike Brown shooting, then came the Freddie Gray shooting, and then ended with George Floyd. And I think that, you know, our whole purpose of bringing this up here and letting you see what the GOJ finally did the right thing on a federal level, for those of you that don't know law or much about law, federal laws always supersede local laws. So this is finally, it's now ingrained, it is in stone. No one can stand there and have deliberate indifference again and not be held accountable for it. If you exchange gunfire with somebody, you have lethal force, you stab them in the neck, whatever you have to do to end that situation, you now must render care. And it's now at the federal level. Any other questions? You got us up here, use us. All right, okay. well I guess we're at 320, so thank you all so very much for your attention and we'll be around to answer any questions.